Welcome to Dialogues. One year ago, President Xi Jinping's visit to your country was lauded as a significant victory. And a few days ago, your president uh, came to attend the military parade on September the 3rd. And he also brought uh, 75 Mongolian soldiers to pay tribute to the victory, commemorating the 70th anniversary of uh, defeating the Japanese fascism. Both leaders reaffirmed their commitment to improve me, the improvement of the bilateral relationship. And I'd like to have your assessment of the current ties. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and uh, I, we really appreciate this frequency of these high-level uh, visits. And also, uh, myself has participated now in World Economic Forum Summer Davos meeting. And uh, Mongolia and China, we're trying to keep uh, this kind of uh, political, economic, or social, all these ties on proper level. And these frequent visits is really giving us a big boost in this regard. And last year, uh, in uh, 2014, uh, President Xi Jinping paid state visit to Mongolia. And also, not only uh, our, my president is participating in this 70 uh, years victory parade, but also next month also, he's going to pay state visit to China as well. And uh, that's why it's really high time to engage more uh, not only in political level, but also in economic level, in business level, in investment level. It's the key area for the open uh, bilateral relationship between our two countries. Mongolia depends on commodity exports for 90% of its foreign trade, and the and the Chinese market is, is, is the most important market for you, uh, and we take. 90% of your exports, and that's a lot. So there is a stronger voice in your country calling for a reduction of your excessive reliance on the Chinese market. Do you think this is a good idea to diversify your exports and above all, not to pin all your hopes on exports, instead you should restructure the economy by stimulating, for example, domestic consumption? Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, Mongolia is uh, surrounded by our two big neighbors, and it's China and Russia. And is that a curse or a blessing? Uh, initially, we thought it's the uh, biggest disadvantage for Mongolians, because surrounded by two big countries, and Mongolia is the second biggest landlocked country in the world. And uh, obviously, it seems like, uh, uh, li like that. But after uh, more deep thought, more deep analyzing the situation, we're surrounded by two big oceans, and we, uh, when we're talking about lead lock at uh, mini. And uh, why it's two biggest uh, oceans? Because China is the, now is becoming one of the biggest market in the world, and all this sea uh, road is going toward to China. And that's why China is located just next to us, and by a uh, uh, plane approaching from Beijing to Ulaanbaatar, it's just one and a half hour by plane. And by railroad, it's uh, within 24 hours we can approach each other. That's why it's biggest advantage, seemingly. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we need to explore this uh, biggest advantage fully. And um, uh, that's why, of course, export, as you mentioned, 90% of our export is um, on mining sector, and mostly it's going to China. And uh, that's why we need to diversify. And we call this uh, policy is rainbow policy, because rainbow consists of, as you know, seven colors. And mining is only one of these seven colors. And there is the huge potential for Mongolians to develop our not only mining sector, but other sector. For example, agriculture and Kashmir. It's Mongolia is one third of uh, world uh, Kashmir or all Kashmir material. And also, there is the also very uh, good uh, uh, chance uh, to develop in our agriculture sector, for example, in meat industry. Because of our uniqueness of uh, uh, nomadic style of life, Mongolian meat is the most delicious, tasty meat in the market. Are you suggesting clearly that um, tourism should be very lucrative? Exactly, and tourism really is one of the seven colors as well. Don't underestimate the purchasing power of the Chinese tourists. <laughs> when they went to Japan, oh, the host country is very happy. Mm -hmm. European leaders welcome Chinese tourists yes. warmly because they yes. have deep pockets. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, and that's why uh, the number of Chinese tourists is increasing uh, year by year basis, but still we need to increase this number dramatically. And that's why we uh, just uh, recently ad adopted new law about free trade 
economic zones and also tourism sectors, we're going to enact uh, very important and going to issue very important decisions. For example, establishing casino and entertainment sector and also in movie sector, in entertainment sector, there is a huge potential to uh, involve more and more tourists, not only from China, but also from other countries. And uh, tourism, as you mentioned, and also IT, ICT sector, information communication technology sector, is also one of the area we really looking forward to. And that's why huge potential, not only in mine sector. I believe you're a, a rising political star given your age. So people in your country are young, and they must represent the dynamics of your country's economy. Um, how do you look at the adversity of the current economic situation? Because uh, uh, commodity exports are declining, and there's the depreciation of your currency, uh, also inflation. Now, the uh, GDP growth rate of 2014 registered only 5.3%. Um, That's the lowest since the year 2010. What do you think of the negative impact of the economic slowdown? How could you possibly overcome the adversity? Of course, now not only Mongolia, but also other countries as well experiencing this kind of uh, problem. If you're solely relying on mining sector, on the export of commodity uh, goods. And uh, this is a really challenging period of time. And uh, because of this commodity price declining and depreciation of national currencies, but Challenge is one thing, and uh, I also heard that in Chinese uh, uh, transcript, it's the crisis, these challenges mean two meanings. One is the, it's of course, it's treat, but the second meaning is, is opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to explore these opportunities. Every, every challenge also produces its solutions. And I think uh, it's temporary problems, maybe it's going to last maybe a couple of years, two, three, four years, but again, in Mongolians, we usually uh, say trotting uh, grasses usually getting richer next year. And that's why this is the exact moment to invest, to prepare for sunny days as well. And sunny days is coming, we will be ready to produce uh, the goods and services which is going to be uh, valued in, on market. Mongolia is known for having very rich copper and coal deposits, mm -hmm. and yet what do you think of the bad media coverage about the negative impact of uh, extracting natural resources in your country? For example, environmental pollution may, put, may be put under very severe scrutiny of uh, not only local media, but the international society, which is watching out for climate change or whatever. So do you think the opposition party in your parliament uh, keeps a, a close eye on this critical issue? Again, uh, for the developing countries, uh, these kind of issues, of course, uh, raising some question marks. And uh, I think uh, you talked about uh, bad examples and some uh, courses and Dutch diseases. But there is also uh, other good, positive, optimistic examples from other countries. For example, Chile and Alaska, Norway. And these countries uh, could manage uh, very uh, correctly their natural resources. And that's why we, there is no need to establish again, to reinvent bicycles in this regard. And we need to learn from other countries' achievements, good examples, to bring it into Mongolian market and distribute them fairly this wealth of natural resources among citizens. But what about the environmental impact? And in terms of environmental uh, impact, of course there is the issue, and especially during the uh, uh, recent years, uh, this issue is uh, getting bigger and bigger, and also carbon pollution and other environmental uh, issues is now rising. And that's why also we need to address these issues. You know, Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed uh, uh, to link up Russia, Mongolia and China under the One Belt, One Road initiative calling for the construction of an economic corridor that puts the uh, three major economies uh, together. Uh, when we're talking about One Road, One Belt policy, and each country call it differently. In Mongolia it's step road and the Russian call it Eurasian uh, economic corridor. And China is one belt, one road, Silk Road, new Silk Road policy. And when combining these uh, similar uh, tendencies, similar approaches, 
principles uh, of these three countries, I think we're going to have good mix and going to have good policy and fundament for dealing with each other. And uh, very recently, in July 9th of this year, the presidents of three countries also met in the Russian city of Ofa and they made a trilateral agreement between three countries establishing this economic corridor, New Silk Road or Step Road. And China is good at uh, making investment, building infrastructure in developing countries. Mm -hmm. We have recently decided to establish the AIIB. Real meaning, as I understand, it's we not only talking about one route connecting three countries. We're not uh, talking about belt, we're talking about real network. And that's why I think it's big real network is very important. And again, Mongolia needs very powerful, developed, prosperous China. And China also needs, its, uh, Mongolia's biggest, its neighbor. We are uh, connecting with each other more than 4,000 kilometers of uh, this border. and. Also, good developing, sustainable, and potential uh, uh, northern uh, neighbor countries, Mongolia, also China is needed. And yeah. that's why establishing this very uh, sustainable, powerful region in this area, also it's like win-win and uh, situation for both of countries, I think. Since the independence of Mongolia towards the end of the Second World War, you know, many Chinese scholars uh, follow the development, political and economic alike in your country very closely. Um, third neighbor policy, mm -hmm. as an integral part of your foreign policy since the end of the Cold War, captures much of our attention. Now, I notice there is a positive and a clear change in your tone and attitude towards this part of your foreign policy. Uh, does it mean that uh, um, you would get very close to China very quickly, and do you think this threatens to upset the United States, which is looking behind, which accuses China of enjoying free riding since perhaps uh, 2001 when China entered into the WTO, and in exactly in that year, September the 11th, terrorist attacks occurred, and the U.S. sent their troops to the forefront to fight terrorists in Afghanistan and Iraq. So, do you, what do you think of your um, enormous efforts to keep balance between major powers, Russia, China, the United States, mm -hmm. in the context of what you call the third neighbor. Uh, exactly, because any country, it's not only about Mongolia, any country surrounded uh, by these circumstances, of course for the important uh, policy that uh, direct neighbors will be a high priority for any country, and that's why Mongolia is acting like that. But again, uh, the, all the foreign activities should not be limited by our two direct neighbors. Also need to be open for other markets, other countries as well. And for this purpose, we formulated third neighbor policy. And we think that it's not alternative to each other. Simultaneously, it can be developed properly. And keeping good balance and keeping good partnership with any country, I think it's the key for the, any countries. And that's why I think there is no contradiction in, to, in terms of keeping third neighbor policy with our two direct neighbors and we're experiencing a uh, very successful uh, uh, this kind of uh, flowing of process during the last 25 years and Mongolia is a very peaceful uh, country and it's now we keep in like neutrality position in toward any position and we have a very good uh, high level uh, uh, partnership uh, with our two neighbors and especially with China for example we are enjoying uh, comprehensive strategic partnership. We, our ties uh, uh, approach at this highest level of bilateral cooperation. This is really enjoyable environment situation. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the positive note in your comments on the bilateral relationship. You are watching dialogue with Mr. Chimid uh, Sehambilig, the Mongolian Prime Minister. We are honored to interview him during his short stay here in Dali and to attend the summer Davos, the economic forum. We shall be back in a short while. Please stay with us.
Welcome back to Dialogue, Mr. Prime Minister. However, during his uh, short stopover in Mongolia, uh, as part of his uh, tour of Asia, former Secretary of Defense uh, Chuck Hegel promised to provide your country with military assistance. That, I'm afraid, must have upset Russia and China in the context of the third neighbor policy, despite your efforts to dilute the uh, the overtones of relying on the U.S. to uh, uh, to withdraw from the shadow of the two big neighboring countries, Russia and China. As I previously mentioned, the foreign policy from Mongolia is very peaceful and we are not engaging in any war activity, any aggressive activity. And uh, only uh, our participation in the world arena is like we are acting only under world uh, peacekeeping operations under the United Nations. And that's why in any visit of any country, of uh, someone who is coming to Mongolia and uh, there is no chance to change this policy. You know, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan has been undertaking global diplomacy since he took office and uh, when he noticed that China is engineering a very rapid military build-up. Uh, uh, also, if you look at the disputes over the Aoyu Islands. So now, do you think uh, Japan is fighting for regional influence in Mongolia in acquired competition? Uh, I don't think it's uh, competition. If it exists, it's not uh, about Mongolia. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I previously explained, that under third neighbor policy, we also keeping uh, trying to keep this close the relationship ties with uh, not only with U.S. but also UN, uh, European Union, and also Japan, Korea, other countries. A few minutes ago, a few minutes ago, you mentioned. Uh, um, the uh, uh, brainchild of uh, uh, Russian President Putin about Eurasian Economic Union and uh, your version about the One Belt, One Road Economic Corridor. Um, behind this ambitious blueprint, I'm afraid, is the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Since 11 years ago, Mongolia has been an observer of this regional bloc. Now, what kind of role do you think SCO or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization can play in cementing the solidarity of the neighboring economies along the economic corridor? As you mentioned, yeah, Mongolia is uh, acting as an observer country uh, starting from 2004 in SCO and uh, it's a Mongolian point of view. We really uh, hope that, I really hope that SEO will act more actively in economic field, in business field, in investment field, and Mongolia is looking at this kind of partnership in, uh, in this meaning. And uh, I hope uh, the main activity, main concentration will shift to economic area. And we hope that as an observing country, Mongolia is also going to get some kind of chance to engage with uh, state members and also other observer countries engaging in this field through our land. But uh, uh, it is said that the many Mongolians are still wary of Chinese superiority and this is the reason a $3 billion loan package from China was booed in the press and why Chinese companies seeking majority involvement in Mongolian mining projects are fighting an uphill battle. We feel quite frustrated in sustaining our investment because of the political opposition in the parliament. Uh, for any country, for its development years, there is, of course, it's like a roller coaster road. And when you enjoy good commodity price and good uh, price on uh, commodities, people will start to think the old investment will flow in itself and that's why some kind of nationalistic approaches will emerge in that we can do all by ourselves why we need foreign investment this kind of sentiment is coming when we uh, there is the uh, reality check is coming when this uh, rainy days is coming like now people start to realize oh not it's not the case we need financial power we need new technology we need know-how just this natural resource itself going to produce wealth and development and that's why this is normal uh, process of uh, any country becoming more powerful more prosperous and that's why uh, i think it's the reason is not china the reason is that mega projects when uh, developing when uh, we are trying to export these mega projects of course some uh, politicized and nationalized approaches is emerging but it's uh, for any country it's normal uh, business of flowing and that's why to convince people to address this issue and 
what kind of benefit is going to bring this particular mega project or certain uh, areas, certain mining sector, or these kind of things, will bring uh, good things. And uh, for Mongolians, this specific approach to, toward any country, any business entity, th there is no case, something like that. And that's why this is maybe in the past it was just temporary issue, but uh, after uh, becoming more mature, after becoming uh, going uh, through all these kind of uh, challenges, people getting smarter and society getting smarter and addressing these issues properly. Mr. Prime Minister, with the end of the Cold War, Chinese policymakers and scholars have been studying lessons that we can draw from countries where colored revolutions took place and where Arab Spring uh, took place. Um, the Soviet Union disintegrated. Now we are studying those lessons very carefully in the hope that we could root, root out corruption. I wonder if you have noticed uh, the high-handed crackdown upon corruption, which is, uh, I mean, the campaign is gaining momentum one way or another. Many members of the in uh, Mongolian parliament are very corrupt. Uh, you have a, a crusading media, you may have very strong opposition uh, uh, political forces in the parliament, but um, some of the Chinese observers uh, who follow the political process in your country say democracy is not a very good therapy. Uh, members of the parliament in Ulaanbaato, they, um, each, during their office terms, they uh, seize opportunities to make money, to maximize their own personal gains. Can you share with us your insightful analysis about the uh, the functions of democracy and whether it can help um, house cleaning. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your direct uh, question. And I think uh, for any society, I think uh, the problem of our our uh, turning and overcoming bureaucracy, uh, our turning this corruption. That is the one of the key issues any government, any uh, governance need to deal with and for not only for Mongolia, for any country. And that's why uh, in Mongolia during the last several years we are fighting with corruption thoroughly and we established new agency for this purpose and uh, uh, all the decision makers, uh, it's more than uh, 40,000 people now, decision makers since every year they're giving uh, their uh, estimation of their all uh, properties and company uh, uh, and other uh, property uh, rights, and it's listed. It's like public companies, you know, listed. And any citizen can go to this website and can explore what kind of uh, wealth owns this particular parliamentary net. Not only a member of parliament, but also just the uh, small administrative unity people and all public servants. It's elig uh, eligible and. It's according to law, they have to fill out this form. And uh, this is also one of the uh, uh, good approach and proper results. And also starting from this January, we started to, uh, we adopted new law about class account. And any decision maker, any company, uh, any ministry, any agency have to report their spending. And uh, all this account, starting from 5 million degree, you have to uh, write down and uh, what purpose you are spending uh, this taxpayer's money. And this kind of activities, action plans, will be uh, uh, throughout the will will explore. And also these activities also led by President of Mongolia. And uh, many activities is going on uh, this direction. And that's why some concerns from investor uh, uh, community, investment community, also in uh, coming uh, near future will be addressed through all the. In this regard, also government submitted new, new law about uh, licensing and new law about inspection. And this overturning all these bureaucratic approaches which surrounded all this uh, business environment uh, situation will be addressed properly after enacting these new laws. And that's why the process is going on and we will be in pretty good shape. And uh, I think any developed country also went through this kind of process. Democracy could also be a problem in fighting 
corruption. It's not the only way uh, in addressing this yes. problem. Democracy itself is not uh, the uh, major factor and reasoning of this uh, bureaucracy corruption. And rule of law should be applied and accountability, that's the most important thing. And that's why also government also trying to act in this regard properly. And whoever uh, uh, connected with some kind of activities, it's not uh, good for the society. The accountability will be on this place and firing everyone. And again, uh, we are the process. And democracy is also a good tool to fight with uh, this kind of uh, negative things. And we will be in good shape in this regard. When government is committed, when society is committed, it's most important thing. Thank you very much for being part of this dialogue. Thank, Thank you. you.